Okie doke. Well, welcome everyone to the San Diego chapter of Papers We Love. Uh, I'm Marvin Humphrey and I usually introduce people uh, and this time I'm going to introduce the first presenter who is me, Marvin Humphrey. <laughs> Super genius. <laughs> Thanks. I'll give myself a round of applause. Okay, and uh, uh, so Nate, uh, uh, oh sheesh, uh, I need to get my notes. I forgot my notes. <laughs> <laughs> so Nate's presentation is going to be on how to share a secret. And my presentation is going to be on when to share a secret. <laughs> so, uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, Quadriga CX. Quadriga CX is a Canadian uh, Bitcoin exchange company. And towards the end of 2018, Quadriga CX was in quite a bit of turmoil. They, uh, they were, uh, many of its customers had been having trouble completing uh, their withdrawals. And a dispute was festering with the Canadian bank CIBC, which is one of the big five banks of Canada, which had frozen access to uh, a lot of the funds, the, the tangible funds of, uh, of Quadriga over concerns about the origins of those funds. So on January 14th, uh, uh, 2019, just a few months ago, Quadriga announced via Twitter that their CEO, Gerald Cotton, had passed away in Jaipur, India from complications of Crohn's disease. He was only 30 years old. Uh, the news was all the more shocking because uh, the announcement of his passing came on January 14th, but the date of his passing was actually December 8th, more than a month earlier. So people started to wonder why the delay? There was a great deal of speculation. Why all the secrecy? Was this related to Quadriga's ongoing troubles? Well, indeed, that was the case. Uh, it soon came to light that 190 million US dollars in Bitcoin had become inaccessible as a result of Gerald Cotton's demise. Prior to Cotton's death, he had been the only person with access to his own personal laptop, and all the keys to Quadriga's cold wallets were on that laptop. You can think of a cold wallet like a savings account uh, and a hot wallet like a checking account. Uh, transactions with external entities are handled via hot wallets and the balance uh, in the hot wallets is kept low as a security precaution to present uh, to limit loss in case the wallet is ever compromised. The cold wallet is never exposed to outside parties and may in fact be on an air-gapped machine. Periodically, funds from the hot wallet are transferred into the cold wallet and just as someone with significant savings would have more funds in their savings account than their tipping account, checking account, typically, you would generally keep more funds in the cold wallet than a hot wallet. Well, that's what Quadrica uh, lost access to. Now, to quote their website, cold wallets by their nature are highly encrypted and were kept off the Quadrica CX server for security reasons. Jerry took sole responsibility for handling of funds for Quadrica CX, and as such, no one other than him can access the coins in the cold wallets. Well, with Quadriga being less than forthcoming about its difficulties and with uh, uh, the circumstances of Cotton's death being so bizarre, speculation exploded. Was Cotton actually dead? Had he perhaps faked his death and absconded with all that Bitcoin? Was it a bit Coincidental that he had passed away in Jaipur rather than Canada, since it's perhaps a little bit easier to disappear from Jaipur than it is from Canada. And the more details that rose to the surface, the more outrageous it all seemed. Quadriga was founded in 2013 by Cotton and someone named Michael Patron. Uh, Bloomberg reported in March that Michael Patron had actually changed his name from Omar Danani, and who had been convicted of identity theft in 2005. Uh, having been involved with the site shadowcrew.com, which sold stolen credit cards. Only two weeks before Cotton's death, on November 27th, Cotton had signed a will 
which made his newlywed wife, Jennifer Robertson, the sole beneficiary of his estate. It turns out that Jennifer Robertson, that wasn't her original name either. Uh, she had changed her name away from Jennifer Griffith. Uh, Robertson claimed that she had not been involved in the business, business while uh, Cotton was alive, but uh, email and other business records uh, contradicted that assertion. So let's revisit some of the details that have slowly coalesced uh, surrounding the events of early December in Jaipur. So Cotton had been diagnosed with Crohn's disease at age 24, six years earlier. On November 30th, Cotton and Robertson landed in New Delhi for their honeymoon. And that same day, a photograph of the two of them in front of the Taj Mahal was published to Robertson's Instagram account. So they were probably actually there. On December 8th, Cotton and Robertson checked into a hotel in Jaipur. Uh, Cotton complained of stomach pains at 6.10 p.m. and was attended to by the hotel doctor. Uh, at 9.45 p.m., he checked into the Fortis Escorts Hospital. The diagnosis was septic shock, perforation, peritonitis, and intestinal obstruction. Quite a severe uh, diagnosis. Uh, and over the next day, he deteriorated uh, he went into cardiac arrest at 2.45 p.m. on December 9th and was placed on a ventilator and was declared dead at 7.26 p.m. of cardiac arrest uh, triggered by a perforation. So these are details that emerge slowly. Uh, the question is now, is this a credible story? It's not that unusual for Crohn's patients to die at age 30, or excuse me, it is unusual for Crohn's patients to die at age 30 under such circumstances. It's more typical for Crohn's patients to die of colon cancer in their 60s. Uh, nevertheless, it's not unheard of for these circumstances, and the narrative is at least reasonable, and other details uh, uh, that have come forth have started to reinforce that. So perhaps the simplest explanation is the best one that the obfuscation and confusion surrounding Quadriga during this time of duress can be attributed to panic rather than an intricate plot. Uh, perhaps Cotton really did pass away as reported, and he's not on the lam somewhere in Asia or South America living the high life with all that uh, $100 million in stolen Bitcoin. But where does that leave us? Well, on April 8th, less than a month ago, Quadriga entered bankruptcy. At this time, it's still not clear exactly what uh, all that money, where that meant, what, uh, but it seems likely that uh, people are going to be likely, uh, lucky to get back 10 cents on the dollar. Uh, this sort of situation is far less likely to happen with an institution that qualifies as a bank and thus is subject to financial uh, regulations. The Quadriga was not subject to regulation because it was not operating as an exchange under Canadian law. So how do we guard against fiascos like this in the future? How do we ensure that funds are protected both from embezzlement, as is rumored to happen, have happened at Quadriga, and from accident, as is reported to have occurred at Quadriga? What technical means should we adopt? whether voluntarily or mandated by regulation. And so Nate's upcoming talk will present an algorithm which allows a secret to be shared amongst multiple parties. And it provides one answer to this question. In order to guard against embezzlement or similar, you probably don't want to entrust any single individual with the complete access to all of your keys, like Quadriga did, uh, and uh, Adi Shamir's algorithm on how to share a secret makes that possible. So perhaps you want to spread a key across multiple parties, but you also don't want to lose access to the locked resource if some fraction of those parties lose access to their keys, creating a situation like Quadriga is in right now. And Shamir's secret alg uh, sharing algorithm isn't the only way to respond to the challenge posed by companies like Quadriga CX but it is a useful tool in the toolbox. And it's also uh, described in a great and deliciously short paper with some fun math. And so uh, with no further ado, I'm pleased to introduce the main event for this evening, How to Share a Secret, a 1979 paper by Adi Shamir, presented by Nate Gentile. Let's have a warm welcome for Nate.
Okay, so this paper is pretty short, so hopefully this presentation won't be too long either. Let me wake this thing up here. Okay. Okay, I'm just going to do a little test here. Is this going to work? Or... Ditch some things on my screen here so you can see that it moved earlier yep 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 yeah I'm just making sure my windows are set up correct okay okay cool all right now I'm ready I hope you're all ready do I need this should I you're good okay it's nice though okay um, okay so how to share a secret by Adi Shamir um, yeah, so uh, this was a pretty cool paper, and it was only two pages long, so awesome, short papers. Uh, I didn't think this was too difficult. Um, well, there were some challenging parts, um, but let's just start with like the, the main thrust. This is the entire abstract. Not only is the paper short, but the abstract is short, too. Um, and um, so, so just to, I think we should just take some time to just kind of delve into this. Uh, this sentence here and notice like some of the key uh, variables so we've got D and then we've got N and we've got K and those end up being like the the things that we're gonna talk about uh, tonight so uh, data D um, that's gonna be your secret in most real-world scenarios that is gonna be a private key it's gonna be a private key for encryption you're either gonna use it to encrypt some data or you're gonna use it as a dig digital signature um, so you're going to use some public key crypto scheme and you're going to, yeah, either you're going to, you, you want to keep some data secret. So you, you hide the encryption key um, and you're, you're going to split it up into pieces or you want to split up the ability to sign something. Um, those are kind of the two scenarios. And the thing that you're going to keep secret is data D and that's going to be like, uh, let's just say it's a 4,096 bit RSA key just to be really concrete. That's what we're gonna be working with. Um, and so we've got N, and that's N pieces. Um, and then we've got K. K is also a number of pieces. Um, N is gonna be greater than or equal to K. So like, uh, we're gonna split up D into N pieces, um, and we're gonna be able to reconstruct D with K pieces, K or more pieces. Um, so you could have a three of two scheme. You could have a five of three scheme. You could have a five of five scheme. Um, but K is less than or equal to, to, to N. And we'll get into, you know, why you pick certain Ks and certain Ns in what scenarios. Um, uh, and in this last fragment of the sentence, complete knowledge of K minus one pieces reveals absolutely no information about D. So it's, if you have, let's say you're in a five of three scheme where N is five and K is three, if you have two pieces, like you don't get any information. It's not like you have some better idea of what the secret is. Like you, you don't have any additional information. But once you cross that threshold and you get that third share, and that's, that's the word that, that we're going to use to talk about these pieces, is we're actually going to use shares. Um, once you have that third share, then boom, you have complete information. So it's like all or nothing. Um, it would be like, uh, yes, they do. And it's that um, all possible values are equally likely. Right, it doesn't change the yeah. distribution. Yeah, so like... In the case of a uh, 4,000 bit RSA key, it's that there are two to the 4,096 possible RSA keys, and they are all equally likely. Um, and so that's what, uh, on the left there, that's what Shamir looked like when he wrote this paper. And that's a rough, yeah, that's probably, I don't know, that's maybe a few years old, that, that picture. But this is the trio, this is the RSA trio. And S. Shamir, he's one of the, the RSA authors. 
Um, and so RSA, their, their publication was published uh, just a couple years before this one. So he's already a big name. People are already like wild, blown away by his, their public key, uh, public key scheme. Um, but he's still, you know, pretty early in his career. And this is just like another thing that he just happened to do. It's super useful. If he had just done RSA, I think it would have been amazing. But um, this is just like another little uh, juicy morsel of cryptographic goodness. Um, Which one's Shamir? Shamir is, is on the left in the old photo, and he's in the middle. Shamir is Israeli. Um, and, uh, and then Ravest is on the left, and then Adelman is on the right in the 70s pi picture. And uh, yeah, like, I don't know that much about Adelman, but Rivest has like some cool stuff. He's done a lot of work recently in secure voting schemes. There's a good video, it's either computer file or number file, but he works through like a secure end-to-end -end voting scheme where like you can be very sure that like your vote has been counted, um, but your vote is still kept secret. It's like really mind blowing stuff. So they're all still active and they have a bunch of money because RSA is a company. So that's good for them. Um, and here's like a more recent picture of, of Shamir. Um, I did a little bit of research into like, what was it like to be in the seventies and be Adi Shamir? And it, he came to the field as a mathematician and like there weren't, I mean, there, computer science wasn't really a thing yet. It seems like right up until the 70s. And then we just had this explosion. We had like relational databases and we had like NP complete and we also had RSA. So we had a bunch of stuff all come together, but he studied as a mathematician. And so um, he sort of said, well, you know, I, if I was a trained computer scientist or a trained cryptographer, I would have approached all of these problems with some preconceived notions, but I didn't really even know like what I was doing or what was hard in the field. So he just kind of went to work and came up with some, some really incredible stuff uh, in a short span of time. Um, so, so what I described is called a threshold scheme. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll just look at this. We'll get a second look at this definition here because we, we saw the abstract. And then a little later in the paper, he just delves, you know, just restates it. So we've got D, the data D, that's the private key. We're splitting it up into N pieces. Um, now we'll use like this subscript here to denote like it's the ith piece, um, knowledge of any K or more of the pieces. You can reconstruct it efficiently. And he says easily, but what he really means is efficient reconstruction. Um, so like the algorithm is gonna run pretty quickly. Um, it's gonna be a polynomial time, poly time algorithm. Um, and knowledge of any k minus one or fewer. You get nothing. And here's, he does say it in a little more uh, detail, in the sense that all its possible values are equally likely. Um, how he, it, it's kind of cool. We'll, we'll, well, first we'll do this initial construction and then we'll show, oh, here's how we do it. And, and that all possible values are equally likely, likely will make a little more sense. And then k n threshold scheme. K N threshold scheme. So K, that's the minimum number you have to have. And then N is just the number of total pieces. Um, and I, I, I liked this little thing. Um, and it kind of gives us a hint to like, what can we do with this? Um, threshold schemes are ideally suited to applications in which a group of mutually suspicious individuals with conflicting interests must cooperate. So like, you have to do a little game theoretic, like game theory kind of thinking in these scenarios. So like, one obvious scenario is like you have a company and like let's imagine we're a very futuristic company and like you know maybe our, our shares are our crypto cryptographic secrets or like our money or maybe we're a Bitcoin company or something like that um, or or you're 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 this guy um, and uh, the <laughs> yeah in in, in <laughs> Marvin's scenario like the mutually uh, distrustful individuals are like the the three people who are running this whole thing. Um, there's some level of mutual, mutual suspicion. It's like you still kind of trust each other, but you don't, you don't have complete trust with these, with these people. So, so what you're going to do is you're going to split things up and you're going to say, well, one person can't run off with the funds, abscond. Um, but like if two people, maybe they conclude or, or, you know, we don't even trust a pair of people, then we'll, 
we'll up it to three. And it turns out with these schemes, we can always increase what n is and what k is. We just and there's some like computational cost, but it doesn't really matter because for the most part, like you're not gonna have like 500 be n. You might have like 11 be n. Um, but uh, yeah, so so it. it uh, there's a social element, there's a game theoretic element. How do you pick N and how do you pick K? Like, let's say you're a company, maybe you'd have like the CFO, the CEO, the president, and the head of HR. So that's, that's four, so maybe, maybe you'd find the fifth person and say, okay, five, and then any big business transactions, we're going to have three people sign off. You could do something too, where you can give extra shares to extra important people. Maybe the president gets two shares. You could you 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 have a way of, of splicing things up, and you could give extra shares to a single person, um, or let's say like like in the case of, of Bitcoin, like sometimes you you're just one person, but like you want to make sure, let's say your house burns down, that like you don't lose all your Bitcoin because your house burned down. So what you might do is split things up and then send one of the shares to you know your parents or maybe send one of the shares to a relative who's trusted. Like there's still some mutuals, like there's still a little bit of suspicion. You're not gonna send them your entire private key and say like, hey, like there's, there's $50,000 of Bitcoin on this thing, like please don't spend it. Um, so, uh, so, so there's always this element of like, well, I kind of trust you, but I don't totally trust you. So it could be one person and then you split things up or it could be multiple people in an organization. Um, so, so that should get your brain going about what can I do with this thing? Um, and so let's start thinking on the math side of things. Like uh, Shamir starts the paper with this example from, it's like a 1969 uh, discrete math textbook by this guy, David Liu. So I found a picture of David and uh, he seemed like a really nice guy and he did lots of uh, work in common at Um so, so he f just used this textbook, this textbook example. 11 scientists are working on a secret project and um, they want to lock up documents and six or more of the scientists need to be present uh, in order to unlock things. So K is 11, I mean K is six and N is 11. Um, and so this is a combinatorics problem. So let's just think of like the naive solution before we get into the cryptography of like, well, how, how would I do this? Um, what's the smallest number of locks? Okay, so this scheme is basically like, you're gonna have like a, like a safe deposit box and like there's room to just attach a whole bunch of locks to this. And then you've got like for each lock, you're gonna have like some number of keys, like exact copies of the key and be like, oh, this key, we're gonna have four of these keys here. They're all gonna go to this one lock. And then, you know, you're, so you're gonna end up with a, a ton of locks and a ton of keys, but you end up with a scenario where like, where you can actually implement the, thre the threshold scheme. It's, it's <laughs> like, this is not the way you wanna do it. Um, and Shamir shows us like a really nice clean way to do it. But, but here you can see like, so co color coded locks, color coded keys, and imagine the, we're in, it's document encryption. Like the locks are locking up the document. So you can see like this, this one scientist, like she can't unlock the document because she doesn't have to get the green key. And uh, the other ones, well, like everyone's missing one key. So they have to buddy up with someone in order to, to unlock this thing. And, uh, and what Lou is trying to get at is just what does, how does this grow? <laughs> Like, how inefficient does this scheme get? And like, the answer is it gets very inefficient very quickly. Um, like, this is the three of five threshold scheme. And uh, here we have 10 locks. And I went through and I probably spent too much time doing this. Um, but if you want to, you can go through and you can find like, and make sure like, yeah, you would actually need three people here to unlock all 10 locks and unlock the document. And, and the trick that I, like, what made sense for me is, like, I notice like, look, pick, pick a lock, look at the color. There's always two keys. There's never three keys of that color. So, like, this specific blue color, like, you've got this lock, and then you've got, like, this color lock. 
So you've got a pair, and then you actually go through all of the locks. They're all pairs. That ends up kind of being the, the trick. But um, if you've seen the n choose k math before, this is this is like the the quick solution to the to the. So you, you can see why it showed up in a combinatorics textbook. Like n choose k is a combinatorics thing. N minus one locks, N minus one choose K locks, and then N choose K keys. So N choose K is like, there's factorial in there. This thing's going to blow up. Um, and yeah, and just 200. So, so for Lou's original problem, 11 and, and is N and 6 is K. You have 252 locks and you have 462 keys per scientist. This, there's a typo there. That should be 11 choose 6 and 10 choose 5. Uh, yeah, you're right. Okay, just yes. you're right. You got me. <sighs> well, <laughs> just forget all that, cause <laughs> Shamir Shamir is gonna show you the the right way to do it. <laughs> the way. The, yeah, Shamir will show you a much much faster way. Um, and his his scheme is based on polynomial interpolation. Um, and I'll get into what that means. Um, given k points, k points, on the two-dimensional plane. I thought it was, like, genius. And the, it turns out there's other things you can do with this. So, like, just start simple. Start with a base case. k is equal to 2. That's, like, the first non like, the first interesting scheme, threshold scheme, is 3 of 2. Okay? So, like, here's, here's how we're going to encode a certain secret. Um, we're, we're going to clean this thing up a little bit later, but the secret is negative 3. That's like, you, we're just going to work off the assumption here that like if you can represent anything that you want to encrypt, you can represent as a number. So the secret is the y? The y-intercept, yes. yeah. So we're, we're going to hide the secret in the y-intercept here. And, um, and, and we're going to work off this like thing that Shamir noticed was like, well... Like, pick a point in the plane. Like, how many lines go through that point? Well, there are an infinite number of lines that go through any point in the plane. Okay. But, like, pick two points in the plane. How many lines are there? There's just one. And so you've gotten that threshold kind of attribute where, like, before you have you've reached the threshold, you have zero information. And then once you reach the threshold, you have complete information. And so this is how we're going to hide negative three is we're going to say it's the line, but I'm not going to show you the line. I'm just going to show you like points on the line. And like, so all of these are points on the line. Once you have two of these points, like you can just, you do this interpolation calculation. You just like solve based on those two points and like you're good. Um, and you could just make, find another point. There's your three. And it turns out it's very easy. Like, if you want n to be really big, you just give people more points. Just pick more points on the line and just hand them out. Um, but usually you only want three. Um, and, like, Shamir briefly talks on, like, well, what's the right ratio of points? And he says, well, it's probably what you want is, like, just barely a majority of, uh, like, k should be, like, just slightly bigger than half. Um, so, to be clear, that is n is equal to 2k minus 1. Did I get that right? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yes, 2k minus 1. Okay. Um, so that's, that's the really simple scheme. And then you can, just take it, you can just take it up a notch. You can go to as big as you want. So what we can do is we can just, do, uh, just increase the degree of the polynomial. Um, so if you just use k minus 1. And if k is 3, then you're using... Um, you're using a parabola. And uh, so here's, here's my equation. This is my, you can see it's, it goes to x squared, and it's a parabola. And the secret I'm hiding, very, very secret, <laughs> is, is a 1. And uh, here, like, two points aren't enough, actually, because there's an infinite number of parabolas that will, like, that you could define that would go through these two points. So, so we're still in that threshold scheme where, like, if you have two points, this is not enough. But if you have three, then, then that's all you need. And let's just give out five points. So 
there, there are five points, and they all go through that parabola. And so if you have three of those points, then you do this polynomial interpolation calculation, and you get it, and you can just keep upping the number of um, polynomial, like the degree of your polynomial. So if you want to go to that scheme that was originally described with 11 scientists, then you'd have a 10 tenth degree polynomial, which is a huge, like really high degree polynomial, but computers can figure that stuff out. Um, and uh, I won't go into detail here, but there are two methods that come up, Gaussian elimination, Lagrange interpolation. You can just solve it. Um, how exactly you solve it is the kind of thing that I would use like a software library for, but he mentions that there are efficient algorithms, easy, efficient, and log squared n. There's probably faster stuff today out there to do this. You usually like just like the actual human practicality of it usually don't go very much above 11 and 6. So it doesn't need to even be that efficient. Um, but they're, they're there. Um, and this is just like a little uh, mathematical point is like uh, cryptography uses finite fields everywhere. Um, so... Uh, we don't actually like like the when we use the real numbers and like the the y axis like it could like uh, the y intercept could be anywhere on the the y axis that's like that's that's too much in this scenario like we have a four thousand ninety six bit private key and so like we it just needs to like among the possible private keys, which is a very large number, but it's not an infinite number. It's not you know, the y-axis that many numbers. Um, so they do this trick. You can create this thing called a finite field. You have to use a prime number, um, which is cool because primes. Uh, but you do this modulo, a prime number thing. Um, and the math still works. You can still use Gaussian elimination. You can still use a Lagrange interpolation, but you have this finite number of possibilities. Why does it have to be a prime number? You'll have to think about that one for a while. Um, uh, yeah, so given inter integer value data D, that just gets that, like, we can make a string into a number. Um, pick a prime P that is bigger than both D and N. N is always going to be pretty small. So that's fine. Um, but D is going to be pretty darn big. And like because like P has to be bigger than D, like we're not going to use this scheme on an image. Because that's going to, like, how do I represent an image, like let's say 100 pixel by 100 pixel image as a number? That's a really, really big number. So your prime has to be huge, and then the math gets harder. And just like your computer has to work a lot harder. So instead, like, we'll probably only ever use private keys. And what we'll do is like, oh, I want to keep this image secret. Actually, I'm just going to encrypt the image, put it on, I don't know, IPFS, like some kind of storage medium where I'm like, pretty sure this thing's never going to go away. I made a bunch of copies of it, but it's encrypted, so you can't tell what it is. Then I'm going to take the private key I used to encrypt it, and I'm going to break it up in this. So if you have a really big piece of data, what you do is you encrypt the data and then break the private key that you used to encrypt it up. Um, yeah, and, and uh, I didn't really talk too much about this. Like, how do you get that? Well, how do you pick your polynomial? Like, what you do is you need to randomly choose the coefficients of the polynomial. Um, so, like, he, Shamir uses Q of X to represent the polynomial, but, uh, like, like, if we look at, um, like, uh, let's see, this polynomial here, like, you can't, you don't randomly pick the y intercept, so like that one doesn't get, but like 0 0.5, you're going to randomly choose that. And for x squared as well as 0 0.5, you're going to, you need to randomly choose those, and you need to like do cryptographically, like secure uh, random numbers. Um, but yeah, you're just going to randomly pick those, um, those coefficients. Um, yeah. So, to, so to restate that, mm -hmm. uh, you've got a number, uh, you've got the P, which is the size of the finite field. Yes. Uh, and it's got to be a prime number which is bigger than the, uh, than the size of D, or the biggest value that D yeah. could be. Yeah. So if it was, 
So if you had 2 to the 4,096 possible values for D, then it would be a prime number bigger than 2 to the 4,096. No. It would be bigger than... Oh, uh, no, no, because that's the number of possible... That's a massive number. That's the number of possible private keys that there are, but this is just going to have to be bigger than 4,000... Uh, fourth... Oh, actually, you might be right. You might be right. Yeah, no, no. Based on what it sounds like. Okay. Yeah, it might actually have to be because the number itself has 4,096 bits. So, yeah. Right? Gosh, that's such a right. large yeah. number. Then it won't, be, it won't be equally likely for all of the, uh, right. the 4,096 possibilities. You yeah. Eliminated some of them because it wouldn't be possible to actually, they wouldn't occur. So then, yep. uh, and then you're going to, uh, 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 each one of the coefficients is going to be some value from 0 to P. So you're going to, mm -hmm. and every one of the coefficients has to be equally likely as well. Yeah. So that means that you know you've got the coefficient for you've got your q of x, and you've got that uh, you know the co the, to x to the zeroth power and x to the first mm -hmm. second squared and x to the, you know a x a one x a two x squared etc. And every one of those has to be an equally likely value from the uh, uh, chosen from the finite field. Mm -hmm. Okay. 100%. Um, okay. Uh, so, yeah, that's what we just looked at. Um, the two methods you listed before, the Lagrangian mm -hmm. thing and the Gaussian, yeah. are those methods of generating this curve? No. No? They're just those like, if, of... if I gave you the points and yeah. you didn't know what the curve was, it's just it's the algorithm. Backtracking for... to the... Yep. Yeah. So... Um, yeah, picking the curve, it's like, well, no, it's just picking random, like, polynomial, or random numbers, and those are the coefficients of your polynomial, so that's how you, you get, you, it, it needs to be, like, this thing where it's, like, totally random, what? Right, because the only, the only predetermined part of the equation is the one you said, so everything else is Yep, pretty, yeah. Yeah, okay, so it's not that. And the order of the polynomial, but that's just because, like, you know what, how much you want to break things right. up. So, like, so how do I turn this into a finite field thing. Um, it just looks like this. And the way I picture it is like, oh, it's, it's kind of like the parabola I saw, but then like this would attach here, and then this would attach here, and this would, you know. But because it's mod, then it wraps around. So you get this nice property of like, oh, so like, yeah, you're only going to get a number that's between 0 and 3. And so that's kind of like, uh, computers are finite. I, so so you, you just, but you have to use a prime number, and then you get this nice, this nice thing. So that's, that's kind of what it looks like. Um, and, and, feng shui is better if you use Yeah, prime. yeah. No, uh, no, I'm, no, they won't, you, I think you, in order to have a finite field, it has to be a prime number. I think uh, it has to be. Well, there's got to be nice properties for it being a prime number, but you can definitely have a, a Galois field that has you know, only a limited number. You know, GF2. I think well, GF2 is a prime. Yeah. <laughs> so but, I you know, but you can have GF6 uh, 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 or something. Can you? Sure. Okay. And it's still a field. Well, let's, let's, let's <laughs> it's still a field? <laughs> Oh, okay. I I was just imagining that it wouldn't be a field. But I was totally assuming that. I don't have a proof for that. Like <laughs> if if the modulus wasn't prime, then it wouldn't have one of those field it would violate one of those field axioms, like Yeah. So I'm thinking That's about what question. makes a field in linear algebra uh, uh, There's like eight different things. It, like, yeah, it needs there's, the, there's a number of properties, and then definitely be, it being yeah. a prime number is not... There's one two number. operations. One, exactly. one operation has a group, and then there's like another... Op it's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's an open question. Um, they might help for the efficiency or something. Yeah. 
just feel I'm assuming it has to be prime it just has to be for for some reason um, so that's the whole scheme it's not that complicated like once you get the intuition like you're kind of like oh okay I, oh that's not just like a, a metaphor that's it that's it wow. that's exactly it yeah like that's everything that's all you need to do um, to break up a secret into shares um, there's there's something that's like kind of related to this and uh, I won't go into into it too much, but it's very related in that it uses many of the same ideas. I'll post a link in the meetup chat. I found like this video, maybe play it at like 1.25x speed, but because he goes a little slow, but he goes through the math really, really well. Um, just of like this scheme of like hiding things in y intercepts, you can use that to do multi party computation. And what you, what, it gets a little more complicated, but um, you like are gonna hide. You're still hiding things in the y-intercept, but instead of just having one polynomial, like you'll have participants in the multi-party computation, and each participant will generate their own random polynomial. And what the the thing that you get out of this, like. Um, it's kind of like homomorphic encryption. You're kind of doing this um, computation, and uh, the parties in the comp in the the parties in the multi-party computation don't get complete information about what the other values are. Um, there's a lot here. This is a talk in and of itself, so I won't spend too too much time on it. But but you could do well. You might be able to do voting with it, but. Um, it, it, it's basically, you might have a scenario where, like, you have a bunch of, like, mutually distrustful parties. They maybe somewhat trust each other. They want to collude with each other, but they don't fully trust each other. This is, like, one of the things that you can do to keep the information that each party wants to keep secret safe, but you're still doing some, um, something useful with it. Uh... There's a uh, Yao's millionaire problem um, is one example of this where you um, the multi-party computation is like you want like you have two employees at a company and the employees want to figure out if they're paid the same amount but they don't want to reveal how much they're paid and you just really need one bit of information from that you don't need all of the information from them how much do I get paid you just need this one bit like does it match what I'm paid or does it not match what I'm paid? Um, and and like now that we understand how these polynomials and the y-intercept works, you can use that as like a base layer of understanding to figure out how the multi-party computation schemes work that use this. Um, so that was pretty cool. Um, something I just want to be clear on uh, is like there's a difference between secret sharing and multi-sig. If you like Bitcoin stuff, you've probably heard the phrase multi-sig. Um, and these are like kind of similar, but they're actually different. Like secret sharing is like you take one secret and you break that secret up into pieces. One of the, it could kind of be a downside of this is like if you want to use that secret to sign something, like, you need to bring all of the pieces together. I almost imagine it like a big, I don't know, like a superhero movie where it's like, well, you must go to the ends of the earth to bring all these things together. Um, but you actually have to reconstruct the secret. So if you have to do that regularly, then a malicious attacker is just going to be like, oh, well, I'm just going to like plant a little something in the hardware that you use to reconstruct the secret, and then I'm just going to get the whole secret. Um, so secret sharing, like, you don't actually use it everywhere you you could, like, you'll use these multi-sig schemes um, uh, just because the multi-sig schemes, um, like, they're more complicated, and they came after Shamir, but you have n different private keys. It's not like you have one private key and you split it up into pieces. You actually just have different private keys. But the schemes work where it's like, oh, it's, you still have that m of n, n of k, sorry, n of k threshold property. So that's cool. And um, there's like one is Schnorr 91. It's a patent. I looked that up. Um, this one BLS is more recent and I've heard it mentioned again, mostly in crypto context. 
Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, if you want to learn more about cryptography, take his Stanford Coursera course, Dan Bonet. Great, great course. Um, and uh, so he, he came up with this, like BLS. Um, this is like a side note, uh, but like you will have... Uh, schemes that are like sometimes called commit reveal schemes um, and BLS ends up in those schemes a lot uh, trying to think like what's a good example of it um, you, you you can use this when like you need to do multiple rounds of signing um, so like uh, there's um well yeah I guess I'll talk about it uh, in in a th the ethereum blockchain like the new version of the ethereum blockchain the second version um they're switching their consensus algorithm from proof of work to proof of stake and how things work is different you're not racing to solve hashes um yeah like you end up with this thing where like usually uh you have to you have a participant and they sign off and they say yep i'm gonna sign this block and i'm gonna say this is a valid block um, and, uh, like in this scheme, you actually want like multiple people to sign off on this block because usually there's a lot of money moving through each block in a blockchain. So you get like multiple signatures and you must pass some threshold of signatures. Once enough of the validators have signed this block, the block is valid. And so you can kind of see where this threshold scheme might be useful in, in the blockchain context is like. I need n, I've got n private keys out there that could sign this block and I need at least k of them to sign before the block becomes valid. So like, and in that scenario you can see like you're gonna be signing all the time and also like you, you're you gonna have these validators that are gonna be geographically distributed. You can't bring them all together like you do in Shamir. So yeah. if I understand correctly uh, uh, the, about this uh, uh, technique for signing a, a block mm -hmm. here, you would yeah. have, uh, uh, so in Bitcoin, you're just, uh, uh, it's raw power trying to, uh, uh, trying to yeah. race to find the right uh, answer. Yep. But in this case, you're basically doing credibility. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got yep. a certain number of parties and exactly what, how they determine that the block is valid is their own problem. Yeah. Uh, and, and then you just have them, and now with the relation here is actually that this is, a, uh, we have a K, there's n total people who have a vote, mm -hmm. and k of them yeah. have to uh, uh, to sign before the block becomes valid. Mm -hmm. And so this is relates to the uh, yeah. Shamir thing in that it is also a thresholding scheme. Yeah, but it's different. And uh, in this scenario, like you couldn't use Shamir because like you 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 can't bring all these people together to reconstruct a private key. Um, so. so yeah. yeah, yeah, which is kind of beside the point. It's kind of beside the point. Um, so, like, yeah, B, uh, BLS Schnorr, these multi sig. And I got a little confused when I was first doing the research. I thought Shamir, secret sharing, and multi sig, I thought they were the same thing. They're not the same thing. Multi sig avoids reconstructing a single private key, so if you have multiple signing rounds. But um, the one case where I think Shamir is perfect is like, let's say, and I'm just using crypto examples here, like, when you have a, a crypto wallet, there's usually a like 12 or 24 word seed phrase that can be used to reconstruct the wallet. And that's like your, your like paper backup. Um, so let's say like your house burns down, your wallet gets melted and you're like, ah, put my life savings into this thing. Uh, <laughs> I hope you didn't do that. Um, but if you need to reconstruct it, that's like a one-time thing and like you don't necessarily need now some wallets are multi-sig wallets but you don't necessarily need that you could just take your single seed phrase and break it up into pieces send it to your grandma send it to like put it one piece in a safe deposit box and then put one piece on your phone and one piece on your laptop or and then i don't know one piece somewhere else but like that's something where it's like it's just the backup i only ever need to once i do this restoration, I'm probably just going to go buy a new hardware wallet and um, and then just start with a new, just repeat the, the the breaking up process again with a new new private key. And that also brings me back to a point, it, which is like if you, with exchanges, 
don't leave your money on an exchange. Like, take it off. Get a hardware wallet. Like, your, not your keys, not your crypto. If you leave it on exchange, it might just poof, go away. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so that's, that's the last bit. Um, and that's it. That's everything. Cool. All right.